It has come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Amen. This means war. One of the things I, I, I recognize about the book of Revelation, that it is a book of signs and symbols. You can't interpret the book of Revelation like you would interpret 1 Corinthians or even the Gospels. The word revelation means to unveil, to reveal. So when you go to the book of Revelation, what you're really looking at is a type of literature that, that in signs and symbols talks about the ultimate victory of God in history. Contrary to popular theology, it's not a book where you can get turn the news on and get a newspaper and read it alongside the newspaper and understand what God is doing. That's not what the purpose was. This book was written to a, a group of churches in the, in, the, in the first century. And it spoke about God's ultimate victory. And it speaks to us the same way. It speaks of God's ultimate victory. We can't uh, time the, the coming of the Lord. We, we, we can't judge what's happening in the world by reading the book of Revelation. Now, some have tried that. And of course, when we do that, we miss what God is saying. Our job is to trust God. Amen. Our job is to trust that God is sovereign, that God is in complete and perfect control. And so I, I love the book of Revelation because it, 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 it really speaks to the grace and the power and the majesty of God. It says that no matter what's happening, God is in control of all the drama. Amen. Everything is working towards an end. And in the end, God is going to win. We are going to win as the people of God. And so the victory is already ours. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, I, I just want to give a little bit of a context. Again, Revelation is a, a book filled with symbols and signs. And, and here, God uses the image of a woman, a dragon, and a child. And it's speaking of the church and uh, the faithful people of God throughout the ages that brings forth the Son of God. And that God, Son, accomplishes his mission, he is called up to God, to the throne room of God. But I, I want you to know that the mission of Jesus calls warfare. When Jesus came, he didn't just come, as you see in the Christmas story, as a little baby, and, uh, and, and he just kind of grew up and, uh, and, and went through the process of healing the sick, and dying without a great conflict coming as a result of his ministry. That's why we today face warfare because of the warfare that Jesus brought when he defeated the enemy at Calvary. And so we look at the, the word of God here. It says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. Now let's just deal with that a little bit. First of all, when we talk about spiritual warfare, sometimes we think it's Jesus and the devil. It's not Jesus and the devil. It's not God the Father and Satan. The devil is not on the same playing field, on the same level with God the Father or Jesus the Son. And so here, God calls on Michael the archangel, who in Daniel we find out that he's one of the chief princes. He is a mighty warring angel, among the number of angels that God has. Michael has a, a particular purpose. He fights on behalf of the people of God. And so it is Michael who fights against Satan, who is nothing more than an angel. Now, now, now uh, that said, he's a mighty, powerful angel. Right? The devil's not running around here with a, with a little pitchfork ready to stick you on Halloween. Right? The devil is a great, powerful entity. Right. And so the Bible says that, that, that Michael and the angel fought that as a result of the ministry of Jesus, there was warfare, there was conflict. And we're going to talk about the nature of that conflict. 
And so the word, even the word Satan is really, the word Satan is really not a name. It's not a proper name. It's a title. Right? He is, it, 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 he's, he is the Satan or the adversary. And so the adversary who has resisted God's work so much that that, that title kind of connects to him. When you say Satan, you immediately think about the devil. You, you, you immediately think about him, just like when you think of the word Messiah or Christ, you immediately think about Jesus. Right. Because Messiah is a title, but Jesus fulfilled the purpose, and, and so we attach the name Messiah to Jesus. So he is Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, because how closely he associates himself with salvation. Amen. And so here Satan is, is in, in this battle with with, with, with Michael. But of course, the great dragon loses. The great dragon loses. And he's forced out of heaven. It says, is this great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one de de deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. And then in verse 10, it starts a, a, a great song. This is a song of victory, a, a song of celebration by the people of God. It says here, it has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brother and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. They did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Now, we start to think about what happened. How did the account? I want you to understand a little bit about the, 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 the ministry or the work of Satan or the adversary, the one who accuses. See, Satan is like a prosecuting attorney. Throughout the age of God's people, he has gone about trying to find an accusation to, to bring before God into God's presence to accuse God's people before God. As a matter of fact, we see this demonstrated in the book of Job, right? If you read Job, the Bible says that the sons of God came before God and Satan, or the Satan, the adversary, came also. He came with them. And of course, he was about his job going up and down and in the earth looking for someone, someone to accuse. And so God, in the, of course, in the book of Job, we learn that, that God presents Job to Satan. He provides, the he provides the limits so that Satan doesn't have free course. How many of you know when you go through a trial, the devil can't do whatever he wants to do to you? Amen. Because God sets the limits. And so God set the limits. And so, so Satan attacked Job within the limits set by God because he was trying to get Job to, to curse God. He was trying to use Job as a way to prove to God that Job wasn't worthy of the faithfulness and the grace that God had shown him. He says, he don't curse you to your face. He, he, let me touch it. Let, let, me, let me deal with it. Let, 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 let me touch his life. You don't see that he, he doesn't really love you out of a pure heart. He, he's not really concerned about, uh, 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 about who you are. He's just serving you because you've given him some good stuff. He's just serving you because you've been good to him. you blessed him. He's rich. He's, he's protecting you. Got all kinds of favor on his life. That's why he's serving you. And so, God allowed him to him to touch him. But the Bible says that Job didn't see him with his mouth. God, Job didn't speak evil. And God vindicates Job at the end of the book. You, you know the story. He gets dealt with for his trouble. Yeah. Now, he didn't understand all that was going on. See, a lot of times we don't understand all that's happening, but I. I I want you to understand that, that, that God is in control. And so, so here the angel, the angel Michael is in war with the devil. See, I want you to understand that the crucifixion was a time of great spiritual conflict. Great war. As a matter of fact, if you go to the scriptures, Jesus alludes to this warfare in, in the Gospels. Turn with me quickly to Luke chapter 10. Verses 18 through 19. So I, I, I like to use the word of God and not just logic to show the truth. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter chapter 10. I want you to go there. I, I could have just quoted it, but I, I want you to kind of go here so you can find it and read it. 
for yourself. And so the 72 who go forth anointed of Jesus to heal all manner of sickness and disease, they go out and they, they do the work of the kingdom in the name of Jesus, right? So when Jesus comes, he's bringing the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the power of God, the breakthrough reality that God is doing, the new thing. That's what Jesus brings. And so he sends out these 72. And they go out and look at what they say. It says in verse 17 that when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, and I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I'm going to stop right there. I want you to go with me quickly to John chapter 12, verse 30. I want to show you something else. I'm going to get back to it. I'm going to tie it up for you. John chapter 12, verse 30. I want you to understand what happened. John chapter 12, the gospel of St. John chapter 12, verse 30. Jesus is talking about his glorification. He's talking about the suffering that he's about to embrace. And in that context, look at what he says in verse 30. It says, and Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come. When Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. So I want you to understand that the, the ministry of Jesus removes Satan from his place of position and power. Now, it doesn't mean the devil ain't busy. It doesn't mean the devil's not still active. It means that his power has been curtailed. That, that now, uh, his, his, he's actually in a, in a way been fired, if you will. I'm going to explain that. So, so look at what the saints say. If you go back to Revelation chapter 12, they're, they're, they're praising God because, uh, because the God's power has come. They said God's salvation has come and, and the accuser has been thrown out. The accuser who accused us before God day and night has been thrown out. Now, would you understand something? As I said, Satan acts like or acted like a prosecuting attorney. Now, you, you know, if you, if you get a ticket, if you get a ticket and you go to court, if the police officer who accused you doesn't show up in the courtroom, what happens? The judge throw it out. Why? Because there's no longer an accusation against you. There's evidence, but there's no accusation. What happened in the gospel is, it is even greater than that. You see, the Bible clearly tells us that if the devil understood what was happening at the cross, he never would have crucified Jesus. If he understood the defeat that would come, he never would have done it. He didn't understand. He didn't see it. He didn't see it coming. God pulled one all over on him. But look at what happens. The Bible says he's cast out. Jesus says that it's time for the God of this world, Satan, to be judged. He's going to be cast out. He's going to be thrown down. What happened at the cross when Jesus uh, lived a holy life? He hung up there and he was crucified. He bled and he died. What he did is he dislodged or, or, or caused Satan to lose his position in the very presence of God. So what happened? See, what happened is, is that Jesus took the blame for all of your sin, took the blame for all of my sin. As a matter of fact, Colossians says that he took the charges and he nailed them, nailed them to the cross. He canceled the charges. Now think about this. The one that we offended, he is the one who canceled the charges against us. He canceled those charges against us. So two things happened at Calvary. Not only did the accuser get thrown out, now the devil is barred and blocked from coming into God's presence with, with an accusation. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And I don't care what I've done in the past. It's covered. It's under the blood. I've been free. I've been delivered. So the devil can no longer use those accusations against me. So what happened is, is not only was the accuser thrown out, but Jesus tampered with the evidence. He took the evidence and nailed it to the cross. So now not only do I not have an accuser, hallelujah, in the presence of God, but the evidence has been washed away. That's why I can be justified. That's why God says, 
You're righteous in my presence because of the blood of my son. I forgive you. I receive you. I love you because of what my son has accomplished. Hallelujah. So that's what Paul was talking about. In Romans 8, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So the devil can't take. See, we got to understand the devil can't use your past against you anymore. Your past is under the blood. You've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. You've been restored. You've been released. Sometimes we let the devil use our past to beat us up, to block us from our future. But I want you to understand that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. There was an old song by a gospel singer that says Jesus dropped the charges. How do you that he dropped the charges? That at Calvary I heard him say, case dismissed. Case dismissed. I'm saved by grace. So I've been forgiven. Devil will take our past and try to use that to beat us up over the head with. Right. Who you think you are? You ain't nobody. Whispering in your ear and trying to use that to make you feel condemned. But look at what Paul says in, in Romans 8. He goes, I love Romans 8. He goes on in, in, in Romans 8 around verse 33. He says this. Look at this. I'm going to read this because I want us to get this. How do you thank you, Lord? See, we, 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 can't just, we, we, we can't just be praising and worshiping God and not know how we praise and worship God. I've got to understand what, hap what happened on Calvary, what victory was won, what was accomplished in, in this thing. Why am I serving God? Does it really matter? Absolutely it does. Romans 8, look at this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Look what Paul says. Romans 8. Verse 33 says, Who dare accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Who's making an accusation against me? God has chosen us for his own. No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised into life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. So not only, my God, not only did Jesus forgive me, but he canceled the enemy's ability to use my past against me. Your past is covered. Your, your past isn't counting you. Your, your past is under the blood. And so what happens now? Well, what if I make a mistake now? All I do is just go to the Lord. Forgive me. See, so Jesus died for sins past, present, and future. He died for all sins. His blood covers all sins. He saved you knowing the sins you would commit. And so your past is covered. So what happened is at the cross, hallelujah, Jesus defeated the enemy. The enemy was cast down, was cast out. He's no longer in a place of power and authority. He had power and authority. He could go right into the throne room. But he was cast out. Now look at it. The Bible says he was cast out to the earth. Now I want you to go back to Luke chapter 10. Look at this. Man, Jesus is amazing. Look at, look at this. Look at this connection. Go back, let's go back to Luke chapter 10. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Go back to Luke chapter 10. Thank you, Lord. Luke chapter 10. Verse 18, let me let me get a sip of water right quick. Look at this. Luke 10, 18, it says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, now look at this. The Bible says he was cast out to the earth. See, see, thank you, Holy Ghost. When you go into Genesis 3 and 15, there's an image, a picture. A symbolic picture of, of God's redemption when he talks about how, how, how the, the, the serpent was, is going to bruise, uh, uh, hallelujah, your heel, but, but you're going to crush his head. The single woman is going to crush the serpent's head. That's a picture of Jesus. That's a picture of the gospel. And so we see, look at this, we see, we read about, uh, uh, about the serpent who, who gets uh, 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 Adam and Eve messed up and they sin and, and he's reduced and he's now eating dust. 
We just see that completely as just a natural serpent uh, 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 being reduced from walking the right to, to eating dust. It's so much deeper than that. But that's pointing to what we're talking about right here. What he's saying is the serpent is going to be defeated. Now look at what Jesus says. He says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Satan is being cast out. Look at what he says. He says, he says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Look at what he's saying. What he's saying is the devil has been cast out. And now because the devil has been cast out in my name, because of the blood that I've shed, because of the power that I've given you, now that devil who was in the heavens has been cast down. And now you have authority over him and he is under your feet. So you understand, the only reason why you have power over the devil is because of what Jesus did at Calvary. The only reason you can pray and the sick get healed, hallelujah, is because of what Jesus did at Calvary. The only reason that you can see deliverance and, and doors open and the works of darkness vanquished or, or banished is because of the work that Jesus accomplished on Calvary. You see that? So he says, it's amazing. He connects the fall of Satan with your personal authority. The devil being cast out because of the work of Jesus. Jesus accomplished salvation for all of us. And because of what Jesus accomplished on Calvary, he gives you not only forgiveness and release, but power and authority. Yes. See, this is a place we, we, we got to live. We got to understand who God called us to be. That I can walk on, on serpents and scorpions. I can, that, that's symbolic of, of, of demonic forces and powers. That's what that represents. The forces of darkness. I can trample on them. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Why? Because of what Jesus did. Hallelujah. Not because of my, my own personal righteousness. Not, not because I obeyed the law of Moses. But because of what Jesus did on Calvary. By faith, I can walk in power and authority and victory every day. And as far as the east is from the west, so he cast our sins from us. God doesn't want us to feel guilty about what happened in the past. God doesn't want us to be worried about what happened last month. God wants us to move forward in him, recognizing that it's covered. It's covered. So that means that we should resist the voice of Satan. It will come to make us feel like God don't love us. Or how can God forgive me for that? Jesus paid it all. And so he says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. Now I want you to understand the concept of testimony. The concept of a testimony is, is a person in, 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 in uh, giving witness to what they saw, right? So if you have experience with Jesus, you get witness to what you saw. But this testimony is deeper than just telling that I saw Jesus or that I believe in Jesus. This testimony goes deep enough. This testimony goes deep enough for you to hang your life on. This testimony says not only do I know Jesus, but, but I'm going to stand by my faith in Jesus. This testimony says I'm willing to die for my faith in Jesus Christ. This testimony says that nothing else matters to me as much as my faith. And whatever the price I need to pay, I'm willing to pay. Yes. Shh, that's the It's the overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. See, I, I, I want you to know you got to have a testimony. See, it's, it's suffering and it's adversity that produces a testimony. If you've never gone through anything, 
you don't really know what God can do. Amen. Amen. If you've never had to bring it to God and pray, then how do you know you got the right God? If God never opened the door for you, how do you know that God is a door opener? If God's never touched somebody in your family or, or touched you in your body, if you only read about what God did to somebody else 2,000 years ago, how do you know that God can do it for you? If you're not connected to a community where you're seeing God move, how do you know that God is able? See, it's that testimony, that, that knowledge of God, being connected to God, recognizing that, that, that God is able to do something uh, about learning how to trust God. As I talked about last week, I've been through some wars and, and some battles, and, and, and in the midst of those wars and battles, I have recognized that I wasn't being defeated, I was being built up, that God was giving me a testimony that I would be able to stand and declare to somebody, Jesus is faithful, God is able. When you're going through adversity and difficulty, that's when you're learning. That's when you're growing. When you're going through the valley situation, that's when things are happening. See, grapes don't grow big and thick on the mountaintop. They grow down in the dark trenches of the valley. When God is trying to make you and build you and bring you, he will allow a valley situation to yes. your life. It's in that situation that we learn about the God we serve. When your baby is almost dead, how do you trust God? When you have a couple of kids that almost die, how do you trust God? When you have a wife that almost died, how do you trust God? When you did everything you got, how do you trust God? When folks call you cursed, how do you trust God? Holding on by a thread. When tomorrow you can be in a box. And you don't know when they go throw your stuff out on the street. You know they come, you just don't know when. How do you trust them? And you don't know what you will eat tomorrow. How do you trust them? It's in those moments. Was it don't matter if I die, I'm gonna die. But before I bow down to you, I'll leave here serving my God. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that adversity, in the midst of that fire, yeah, hallelujah, God met them. Yeah. So I see another one, I see one like the sun. God, right there in the midst of them, God's presence was there with them, and He brought them out. See if it makes sense. It seems impossible. See, I've been through situations that just seem impossible. God loves to get us in those situations. God wants you to cry out to him in the impossible situation. The thing that just seems like it's going to completely fail. Because God wants you to know that you can overcome whatever it is. I don't care how big it is. I don't care if it's a mountain or a molehill. You can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Because in the midst of your adversity, in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your crying, in the midnight hour where you don't have anyone to turn to, God's presence is there. I overcame. See, see what God wants. He wants to raise up a generation to see you can overcome. Yes. We've come to a time in the church where the people are taken down. They're not holding to the faithful standard of the word of God. 
Everything goes. You can do whatever you want to do. God is loving. He's kind. He is. But he still has a standard. Yeah. And if we endure, if we suffer in the Bible says, we're going to reign with him. Yes. So we can be faithful. This means war. See, see, now you can pray. See, I can pray now differently than I prayed before I went through. And for all of a sudden, this can pop in, I can say, well, I know God is able. Let's keep it. Yeah. And we're going to just wait for God to fix this thing. Because yeah. he fixed it for me, he'll fix it for you. Yeah. God turned you around. God healed her. He'll heal you. God delivered them. He'll deliver you. Hallelujah. God is a faithful God. Amen. What is it? It's impossible. Is there anything to hide for the Lord? It's so easy to let the noise of modern life block out the realities of the spiritual world. Look around and you can see what's happening in the, in the natural world and, and that can, 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 can get us off balance and, and cause us to, to think through the, 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 the lens of human wisdom and not through the lens of the word of God. Yes. God is faithful. They overcame. See, 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 to say they overcame meant they went through something. You don't overcome if you don't go through something. See, see, in life, you're going to go through something anyway. You might as well go through for God. Yeah. Mm. Amen. You, you, you might as well go through for, for, for God. If you're going to be touched by, by the economy, you lose your job, you might as well lose it uh, as you serve God. Yeah. If folk don't like you, they don't talk about you, you might as well let them talk about you because you love God. Yeah. If, you, if you're going to get sick, you might as well get sick while you serve God who's able to touch you and to raise you up and to deliver you. Uh, whatever it is, you might as well do it serve God. have a testimony. You can say, I overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of testimony. See, God is looking for us to be faithful, to recognize who he is. Say, God, we, we trust you. We serve you. We're going to overcome. How many of you want to overcome? I want to overcome. How many of you have stuff in your life you need to overcome? I got stuff in my life. I need to overcome. Now, don't, 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 don't say, oh, I got it all figured out. If you say that, that I guess it. No, I haven't figured out. Because in that you got too much pride. Yeah. I got stuff I need to overcome. I need to overcome some stuff. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for us as people like us with stuff that we need to overcome. Yes. The blood of the Lamb meets us and transforms us. We're being transformed a bit of time into the very image of Jesus Christ. You gotta be faithful. Keep trusting God. Keep serving God. Don't back down. Don't back down. This means war. Since Jesus, hallelujah, won the, the, the war, we just got some little skirmishes. We fight, we just little battles. God, in the end, we all win. We just have to keep fighting this. Don't, don't let the devil get in your house. Take, take authority in your house. Don't let the devil uh, 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 overtake your mind. Tell the devil to get out. You don't have any right to be in my mind. Get out of here, devil. Amen. Amen. So the devil and your children, start put, lay your hands in the name of Jesus. Come on, man. Lose it. Lose his mind. I've done that before. Yes. Oh, that sounds old fashioned and superstitious. You can call it what you want to. The devil got about my house. Amen. You want the devil to get out of your house, you take authority. Because the devil, he said, use your kids. He'll get in you, he'll get in your wife. If you let, if, if we're not good. Now, don't, don't, don't try to lay hands on your wife. You might get knocked out. What you do there? What you do there is you pray. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the point is just that the enemy looks for any door to use. And we have to be on our guard because this, is, this means war. But we're overcomers. By the blood of the Lamb, man. The word of our testimony. See, see the testimony. How the testimony is not just that, that God is faithful. The testimony speaks to the fact that, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That Jesus saved that God saved me, that God redeemed me. And as I continue to trust God, that same testimony is going to bring me all the way to glory. Yeah. It's the testimony of Jesus. When you overcome, that's the testimony of Jesus. When God brings you out, that's the testimony about the gospel. See, if God saves you, he ain't going to leave you to yourself. He ain't going to leave you alone. He's going to be on your side. 
Sometimes we have things that you know, we, 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 we think uh, God don't care about. God cares about everything. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, this is a concern for me. This is an issue for me, God. Speak into this thing. Speak, God. And be glorified in it. God wants to be glorified in, in our lives. And so as we continue to serve God, as we continue to walk by faith and not by sight, we're going to see God do amazing things. God's going to do amazing things. Amen. 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 If you're resting, you're free to pray for you. Whatever it is, whatever it is, your 
holding. I want you to release it right now. Just going to take a few seconds in this space, in the spirit right now. I want you to release it right now. Release that person right now. Release that person right now. I want you to say to yourself, I release whoever that person is. Say their name. I release. I release Fred. I release Mary. I release John. Whoever, whoever it is, you say to yourself, release them now. Release them now. I release my, my husband. I release my wife. I release my children. I forgive them. Release them right now. 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 Don't hold anything. Don't hold anything. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go right now. Thank you, Lord. God wants to do some relationship building in this ministry. Yes. Some of us are holding things against one another and can't, we can't build because we're at odds. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God wants to build a greater unity in this house. But there's some stuff that we're holding, we got to let it go. When I say release it, I don't just mean you just tell God, Lord, I forgive so and so. I mean to live like you forgave. Because when I forgive, that means I make myself vulnerable all over again. I'm going to love my brother and my sister as if nothing ever happened. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just stay in this place for just a moment. Thank you, Lord. Release it. There's some dynamic things that the Spirit of God is starting to do in your midst. He's stirring some things. There's some things stirring in the spirit realm. And I want to see them come to full manifestation. I want to see the full fruit of what God is doing here in this house, in this season, in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you. We release all of our cares and concerns to you. Hallelujah. Father, we're not idols. We're connected. You put us together as a body, God. Hallelujah. We're living stones built upon one another, God. Stuck together to each other. Hallelujah. Built upon that cornerstone and the foundation laid by the prophets and the apostles. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you knit this house together. Thank you, Lord. Heal every breach. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heal every breach. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Let me say this. Let me say this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. There are some breaches. Thank you, Lord. There are some breaches in the ministry. And as you release, as you release those breaches, things that we're holding, if you release them, God is going to do some miracles in relationships in families. God's going to do some miracles in relationships that, 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 that we don't think are salvageable that we don't think can be saved. God is going to do some miracles in those relationships. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I don't know why I'm staying here so long, but somebody needs to hear this clearly. Hallelujah. Release whatever you're holding. Release it. Release it now. In the name of Jesus. I don't care who you're holding it against. Release it. Release it. Release it. Hallelujah. Father, release. Oh, thank you, Lord. We release it. We release it right now. We release those things that we're holding. God wants to do a great work here. Release it. God wants to bless you. Release it. God wants to anoint you. Release it. Release it. Release it. Release it. Release it now in the name of Jesus. Release all self-righteousness. You ain't better than nobody else. Hallelujah. At the cross of Christ, the ground is level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to really release it. Hallelujah. Some of you are really released yet. We're going to leave you here just a little bit longer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It doesn't have to be a big emotional outpour. It's just a commitment to your, of your will. God, I release it. I release it. Sincerity and steadfastness. I know I was talking about testimony and the blood of the Lamb and war, but God wanted me to say this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so, Father, I thank you right now. Thank you, Lord. Father, I rebuke every false 
allegation that the enemy has set up in our minds against each other. Every false witness, every lying witness, I bind and rebuke the accuser of the brethren right now in the name of Jesus. Pull down his works in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this house. God, I thank you for the plans you have for this house. And Lord, we'll give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, it is so. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Give God some praise.